I've had a word on my heart for this last few weeks for myself and for us, God's people meeting here. I believe it's a word that we need to take seriously if we are to do what God expects us to do. So it's a word from Psalm 78, a psalm we looked at some weeks ago. Razak referred to, I think, when we dedicated some children. And it's good to see what God wants to say to us this morning and in the coming days. It's Psalm 78. The heading of the psalm is God's guidance of his people in spite of their unfaithfulness. And we see that the, all that God did for his people and their unfaithfulness, they continue to sin, continue to be stubborn and rebellious. And we must not think that, no, that cannot happen to me. I believe that of all the people in the world, we are in most danger because we've heard the most profound things in this church for 42 years. And whether it's 42 years or whether two years or just two months, you've heard things that you probably never heard before, wherever you were going. So I pray that God will speak to our hearts this morning. And if you look at Psalm 78, it says, Listen, listen, O my people, to my instruction. Verse 1. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. We will not conceal them from their children, but tell to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and his strength and his wondrous works that he has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should teach them to their children, that the generation to come might know even the children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children. Listen to this. The children yet to be born, that they may arise and tell them to their children. It's our grandchildren. What is it that we are to tell them? Verse 7, that they should put their confidence in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. And that is what we are to tell our children when we dedicate them. It's not some kind of ritual we go through. I hope we see that this is what God expects us to teach our children, that they should put their confidence in God. But how can they put their confidence in God if mom and dad don't have confidence in God? Mom and dad have confidence in their abilities, in their achievements, in so many other things, in their bank balance, in their property. That's how it is today, sadly, among God's people. And that's what God says there, <coughs> that they should put their confidence in God, not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments and not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not prepare its heart and whose spirit was not faithful to God. And as I thought about this and been meditating on this for the last couple of weeks, I said, Lord, let it not be said of us, of my generation, that we were a generation that did not prepare it's heart that our spirit was not faithful to you. Let it never be said. 
And I pray that that would be the desire of all of us here, that we will not belong to a generation. The generation that's here, some of us who are older, and the generation that's growing up among us, and the generation that is coming up soon, children yet to be born. I pray that we would really be gripped and prepare our own hearts first before we can teach our children. And if our hearts are not prepared, if we have not learned to put our confidence in God, in all that I have been hearing, in all that God has been speaking to me, in all that God has allowed into my life, good and bad, supposingly bad, it's never bad because God works it out for our best, that we have confidence in God. It should not shake our confidence in God. The next verse says, The sons of Ephraim were archers equipped with bows, yet they turned back in the day of battle. You get time, you look at that in 1 Chronicles 12. We don't have time to look at it. They were such expert archers. They could shoot an arrow with the right hand and with the left hand with such power and such force. They were, they were the commandos of Israel. Their faces were like lions, it says. Such mighty men. But they turned back. You read that in Judges 20, in the day of battle. So it teaches us that whatever it is, we cannot put confidence in anything that we have achieved or not achieved, that we have or we don't have. Our confidence must only be in God. And it says that we will not conceal them from our children, but tell to the generation that we live in and the generation to come, put your confidence in God. I hope we teach our children that, not in their abilities, not in their cleverness, not in their intelligence or lack of it, or anything, or their good looks. Put your confidence in God. We have a father, like we heard Stephen pray in heaven. We have not been left as orphans, Jesus said. I'll not leave you as orphans. I'll never, never leave you, nor forsake you. We have such wonderful promises. Does it help us to put our confidence in God? Has it helped us that our confidence in God has increased? That our spirit is faithful to God? Our spirit. You know, it's, it's one thing to be faithful to God with our mouths and testify and say all kinds of wonderful things. But is my spirit faithful to God? It's a husband and wife who love one another so deeply and so attached to each other, that they have such confidence in one another. That's how it must be. That's a very, very weak example. Multiply that a million times more, that, that we love God so much when we see what he's done for us through Jesus on the cross of Calvary, when we see what Jesus has done for us. He's taken our place, that you and I today, sitting here, should all be under the wrath of God, should all be condemned to hell, but Jesus has saved us. And we think of all that, when we think, like we sang in that song, when I survey the wondrous cross, every time I sing that song, I, I like to go back 2,000 years and stand there, not far off, but stand at the foot and meditate and see, see the love that flows from him. I believe we need to go there again and again, my brothers and sisters. Some of us who have drifted, some of us who have grown cold and lukewarm, some of us who have lost our confidence in God, some of us who put confidence in our achievements and our abilities, and, and some of us who despair because we don't have, we have not achieved. I, I feel I'm a loser. You're no better than the one who has confidence in his or her achievements and abilities. You're no better if you feel you're a loser. You have no confidence in God. You can never feel that you're a loser if you have confidence in God. At one time I did feel like that. It nearly cost me my life. I was a loser. 
despaired of even life. But I thank 50 years ago, November the 17th makes 50 years since that day, and I can picture it when I repented of my sins, repented so deeply, I was so broken. And I turned to Christ. And I found what I was looking for in the world and in human beings, I found in Jesus. And he changed my life. He turned me inside out. November the 17th made 50 years since that day. I thank God that my spirit has remained faithful to God in these 50 years. There have been ups and downs, there have been times of backsliding, but I've come back. I bounce back quickly. I thank God for that day. I thank God that I found a father in him where I never heard, never know, knew the love of an earthly father. And all I knew in my home was fights and quarrels and conflict. It left such a scar on my life. But I never blame my past. I never blame my childhood. I never blame my parents or my upbringing. They did their best. They had no light. They were not born again. I stopped finding fault with what I did not have in the past, a good childhood. I found I had a father in heaven who cared for me and that helped me to put my confidence in him and that has never been weakened through all these 50 years. God is my witness. It's grown stronger. And I have sought in all, in all the mistakes we made to teach our children, put your confidence in God. God blesses you, praise him, give thanks to him. Don't get puffed up, don't get proud. Put your confidence in God. Give him thanks if he has blessed you, whatever it is, materially, financially, in your job. But never lose confidence in God. Our children must see this, my brothers and sisters. They must see that we have confidence in God. I cannot teach them, you know, like teaching them uh, physics and chemistry. They must see it demonstrated in my life. They must see that mom and dad have such confidence in God. And I believe my children have saw it in the different situations that we went through. That we had confidence in God. Young Timothy would have seen that in his grandmother and in his mother. In Timothy, if you look at it, Second Timothy chapter 2, here's a good New Testament example. Many, many examples there. I'm just pointing out two. One from the New Testament, one from the Old Testament. Young Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, Paul says, I'm mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice. And I'm sure that is in you as well. You see? Grandmother, mother, grandson. What a man. He became an apostle. God made him an apostle. She had left her legacy. She never left him property. Lois never left her, her daughter any property or a big bank balance, but she left, left a legacy that is worth more than all that this world can offer, millions and millions. She left, she left faith in her daughter Eunice. She put faith in her heart. Trust God, my daughter. Have faith in God. Put your confidence in God. And Eunice saw Lois the way she lived. I thank God I had a godly grandmother. She's probably the first person to go to be with the Lord in this church many years ago. Right in the beginning of the church. And, and she came to have that faith and she came to know the Lord as a Roman Catholic at 60 years. Willing to give up all her idols and, and trust God. And whenever she felt sick, you know, when we want to take her to the doctor, she says, no, call, call the brothers. Ask the brothers to come and pray for me. Every time, right till she went to be with the Lord. And she passed that on. Sadly, some of her children didn't get it. And, but some did, I believe. 
And so that's how it was. Eunice passed on something to Lois better than any, any inheritance. And Lois passed on something to Timothy, even though he had a, a father perhaps who was not converted, who was a Greek businessman. But she gave Timothy, she didn't blame, oh, my husband's unconverted, he, and she didn't keep preaching to him. She lived her life. And I encourage all sisters, I've always told sisters, live your life according to 1 Peter 3. You can win your husband without a word. I've said this to many sisters here who have had disobedient husbands. You can win your husband without a word. By your behavior, by your example, by your humble and meek spirit which is precious in God's sight. That is how Lois lived. And she brought up young Timothy that he became an apostle. Paul said he had no one else with the same spirit that he had who looked for Christ's interests and not those of him, himself. No one else of kindred spirit, he said. And then we have young Josiah in the Old Testament, Second Kings in chapter 22. Second Kings chapter 22, verses 1 and 2. Listen to this. Josiah, Josiah was eight years old. Eight years old. All, all of you who have eight years old, children, when he became king and he reigned 31 years in Jerusalem and his mother's name was Jedida. Take note, you know, the Holy Spirit mentions the mother's name, the daughter of Adair of Boscat. He did right in the sight of the Lord, walked in all the way of his father David, nor did he turn aside to the right or to the left. And Josiah brought a revival in Israel. He purged Israel of idolatry. He was a radical man. His mother had left something. His mother had given him something. She taught him to put confidence in God. Don't be like the other kings. Don't be like your father. Don't be like all the ones before you. Josiah, live for God. Put your confidence in God. Obey God. Keep his commandments. She taught him that. From eight years old, from eight years old, he became king. He was, he was fit to be king at eight years. She did a work with him as soon as he began to understand. Maybe right from small when she would read to him. Right when he was two years, three years, four years, five years. And young Josiah would be at, at her knee and she would teach him God's ways, and she would teach him God's commandments, and teach him to put confidence in God, and obey God, don't be like all the others. What a revival he brought. He reigned 31 years. Israel never saw a king like Josiah, upright. He says he neither turned to the right or to the left. That's how we are to bring up our children, my dear brothers and sisters. That is what we are to teach them. If we have failed, we can repent of our failure. We can ask God for forgiveness. I have had to ask him that till today when I think. And I've always said, if my children go astray, even when, after they are married, I am to blame. I will not blame them. I will not blame their wife. I will not blame their husbands. I will take the blame. And I go before God and say, Lord, where have I failed? What have I not done that I should have done? That they have problems in their marriage, that they have problems in their home. Don't blame the wife, don't blame the husband, those of you who have married children. Blame yourself. I blame myself. I'm not telling you something that I've not done many times. As they grow up, they made mistakes. Like all young people, they go astray. They turn away from the Lord. I've gone on my face before God and wept. If we would do that more, my brothers and sisters, we would bring up a godly generation. We would bring up a generation who would prepare their hearts for God. That we don't put confidence in anything else. We put confidence only in God and His Word that He's given us. Philippians chapter 3, which we heard during the conference, verse 3, it says, We are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God and glory in 
Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Shall I read that again? I encourage us to have that before our eyes. We want to know what it means to be fully circumcised, 360 degrees of full circumcision. Here it is. We worship in the Spirit of God. God is a spirit. And they who worship Him must worship Him in spirit. And the Father seeks for such to worship Him. He is not impressed with all our good singing and our wonderful songs and even the words that come from, from our lips. If they come from our heart, oh yeah, God is pleased because we can worship Him in spirit. If my spirit is faithful to God and I sing those songs, and I give him thanks and praise. We did that a little while ago when we, we saw what that man received, not silver and gold. He received something better. He didn't go around like, I like that, what Stephen said. He didn't go, go around looking to receive something. Is there anyone here, you come to this church just to receive, to receive something? Sadly, there have been people like that. They come here to receive, oh, it's a good church to belong to. They take care of all the... They take care of you when you get sick. They help pay your hospital bills. They help you in need. Are you coming for that, for some material financial benefit, my brothers and sisters? Or you're coming to give glory to God? You're coming to give praise to God. He went into the temple walking and leaping and praising God. No more looking around for handouts. He wanted to give. And have you come with that attitude? with that spirit. You'll bless this church immensely. We will be a generation that will prepare its heart for God. May God raise up many like that in our midst. Put no confidence in the flesh. We worship in the spirit of God. Glory in Christ Jesus, not in our achievements, not in anything we have done. And don't despair because of your failures. Glory in Christ Jesus, that he can lift you up, that from a failure he can make your life count for God in the days ahead. He will do it, my brothers and sisters. You need only to trust him. Put no confidence in the flesh. No confidence, zero confidence. Oh, that we can be gripped with this. But sadly, God's charge against his people, we see that in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 10. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 10, a word we have looked at many times. Good to be turned to that. Some of these scriptures, often Hebrews 3, it's a quotation from the Old Testament. Maybe we should look a little before that. It says, therefore, just listen to it, verse 7. Just as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me, as in the day of trial in the wilderness, where your fathers tried me by testing me and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was angry with this generation. We were sharing this yesterday with, with some brothers and sisters in the other side of the city where we met together. And... And I was saying, can you imagine that all that they received, manna from heaven, water from the rock, and supernatural healing, many, many things. And we have, we have received so many things from God. And ever since we came to this church, we, it has gone so well with us. But is it possible that, that God can be angry with us? He says, therefore, I was angry with this generation and said, they always go astray in their heart, and they did not know my ways. As I sw swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. They always go astray in their heart. And they did not know my ways. And that's where we have to take to heart what Proverbs 4 tells us. Watch your heart with all diligence. For out of it flow the springs of life. Watch over your heart with all diligence. Because it's there that you and I go astray. If I'm not careful to watch over my heart with diligence, I'll go astray. And the Holy Spirit tells me that I have to watch over my heart with all diligence. It's a military word. 
because from it flow the springs of life, the issues of life. Because it's in our hearts we go astray. In our hearts we begin to doubt God's love and goodness like our first parents in the Garden of Eden. In their heart they went astray. And then their mind was prepared to listen to the devil's lie. That's why we have to watch. That I don't go astray in my heart. My, then my mind is prepared to listen to the lies of the devil. And that's what made them sin against God and disobey God. We can never experience God's love in all its dimensions if we don't have the power of the Holy Spirit. If I doubt God's love and goodness, there's something wrong. I've never been immersed in the Holy Spirit perhaps, Oh, maybe one time I was, but now I'm not really seeking to be filled with the Holy Spirit because only the Holy Spirit can shed abroad in my heart the love of God. Romans 5.5 5. The love of God is poured into our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit. And Paul says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16, he said that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. Ephesians 3, 16. There were some things that Paul prayed for this church. Ephesians 1, 17. He prays there that God will give them the spirit of wisdom and revelation. And many things there. Four things there. And here he says that God will grant you according to the riches of his glory. To be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. So that. <coughs> listen to this. Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that Christ may feel at home in your hearts. That's the Living Bible says. That Christ may feel at home in your hearts, that you be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. That we can know the love of Christ, it says, which surpasses all knowledge. And when I Continue that way, I'll be filled up with all the fullness of God. But what do I need? I need to be strengthened with power through His Holy Spirit in the inner man. I need the power of the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, I'll go astray in my heart. Because it's there that backsliding begins. Not, you know, not in staying away from the meetings. That's, that's a symptom. But something has happened way back. It's not because you don't have interest to come to the meetings. It's not because, you know, you, you don't read the Bible, you don't have interest in the Bible, and your prayer life has gone down. It's something that started way back. I need to go way back and see I've gone astray in my heart. That's where I need to come back to God. That's where I need to repent and confess and see where it is I went wrong. Where is it that I slipped up and I was careless? And repent and come back to God and seek for the filling of the Holy Spirit. Lord, I need the power of the Holy Spirit. I want your love to be poured out within my heart through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's how we can keep our hearts. That's how we can prepare our hearts. There are four things I just want to share very quickly with you. That four things we must have confidence in God in preparing our hearts. And the first thing is this, that we need to have confidence in God's love. Confidence in God's love for us. Otherwise, we'll go astray. Otherwise, we will not be able to prepare our hearts. And we will not be able to teach our children. I must have confidence in the love that God has for me. Look at John 17. We've heard this Many times. Some of the verses we are looking at this morning, we have heard many times in, in the past year. John 17, verse 23. Jesus prayed in his prayer here. He says, I in them, John 17, verse 23 and 24, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me, and the world may know that you loved them, even as you have loved me. That's the prayer that Jesus prayed for us, for you and me. 
Not just for those disciples. He said that to them. I don't pray for these alone, but for those who are going to believe in me through their word. That's for you and me. That the world may know that you sent me, the first thing, by observing our lives. And the world may know that you love them as much as you love me. Do you believe that, my brothers and sisters? Or is it, I'm not too sure. Then your heart is already going astray. And that's where unbelief attacks our hearts. And that's what gives us a heart failure, I was saying yesterday. Unbelief causes heart failure. In men's hearts, it says, in the last days will fail them for fear. Fear, unbelief leads to fear. These are two things that cause a heart failure, unbelief and fear. Remember that. Spiritual heart failure. But if I believe God, I believe his word, I believe what Jesus prayed and that God the Father has answered that prayer, that Jesus, that God the Father loves me as much as he loved Jesus. We have heard this umpteen times, many times. But has it made us secure? Has it made us put our confidence in God? Oh, we just take it lightly. And it's not just that we know, notice there, the world will know also. The world will look at our lives and say, oh, this man, he has something different. This woman, she's something different from all the other women, from all the other ladies. The world may know the Father loves us. It's a, that is how it must be, my brothers and sisters. They saw in Joseph that he had a different spirit. He has a man with a different spirit, Pharaoh said. Daniel and four kings saw him with a different spirit. That's how it must be. People around us, the people in our office, in our work spot, must see that we have a different spirit. We are not the same like people. And I pray that for my children. I pray that uh, for my son in his business. That the people will see that he has, he's not like other businessmen. And that's what I sought to be. That I have a different spirit. I did business for 35 years. And I did it to glorify God. I did it to support my family. Because we decided right in the very beginning, way back in 77, that we would not take any money from the church. We would support ourselves, Brother Zach and me. And by the grace of God, that's what we did. And God blessed my business. It prospered. But the people who came in touch with me, the clients who came in touch with me, saw me, I'm a different businessman. That's how it must be. You're doing business, brothers. Let your clients see that you're a different businessman, that you have a different spirit. The world must know that the Father loves us. And in our work spot, in our neighborhood, your neighbors must see you as a different wife and a different mother. What do they see and hear from our homes? Conflict, quarrels, fights. They say, there's no better. They go to that church there who preaches a lot of high-sounding things. Many people term, call us legalists and we preach law. And it's a sad thing when they see that people who belong here do not have a testimony where the world knows that the Father loves us. That we, yeah, we make mistakes, we fail sometimes. But we see we're quick to humble ourselves, quick to ask for forgiveness. And that is how it must be. And how, how has God loved us? What Jesus said in verse 24. He says, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am, so they may see my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. Do you believe that? The Father loves you and loves me before the foundation of the world, not just before we were born, but before the foundation of the world. Do you believe that, my brothers and sisters? That's the confidence we are to have. If you never believed it, ask God to burn that into your spirit this morning, that God the Father loves me as much as he loved Jesus. The world is going to observe that the Father loves me, and the world is going to see that the Father has sent Jesus. And I'm going to be gripped with this, that the Father loves me even before the foundation of the world, even before I was created in my mother's womb. 
That's how much he loves me. Oh, may God really help us to have such confidence in him to believe his word. Second thing I want you to see in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. In verse 19, he says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence, we don't have time to look at everything here. God speaks there about the new covenant. Verse 16, the covenant I'll make with them after those days, says the Lord. I put my laws upon their heart, on their mind. I will write them. And their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. And it says in verse 19, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. Confidence in the blood of Jesus to enter the holy place, which means we enter right into the presence of God, which they never had the right under the old covenant. Only the priest could enter, and that too with blood. And they tied a rope to his leg just in case there was some sin in the priest's life or something that God was not happy with when he, even though he went in with the blood and he would drop dead there. And they would have to, they couldn't go in because anybody would go in, like Uzzah would touch the ark, would drop dead. They couldn't go in and they had to pull him out by this rope. That's how awesome it was. That's how fearful it was under the old covenant. Once a year, with blood. And there's no guarantee that he would come out alive. What about us, my brothers and sisters, today? We have confidence to enter the holy place, right into God's presence, with no fear of death, because Jesus has paid the price. And because Jesus has paid the price, and we don't drop dead, do I take the blood of Jesus lightly? Do I treat it as tap water? Is that what it means to have confidence in the blood of Jesus? No, never. God forbid. I never treat the blood of Jesus like tap water. I never treat it as a cheap thing. We are not redeemed, Peter says, with silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. What it cost him. We have a fraction, a wee bit uh, sense of what it really cost him. We would only know in eternity what it really cost him. Forsaken by the Father for you and me. He paid the price. And he says that we have this confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. I thank God for the blood of Jesus. I never want to take it lightly. I never want to treat it as some cheap thing, as cheap tap water. I want to value it. I did at one time. I didn't understand. What, what the blood of Jesus really meant. I didn't understand when it was all, you know, you can sin and go and ask for forgiveness. Once saved, always saved. A deception. I thank God he opened my eyes, brought me out from there. Confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. I hope that you have that confidence, that you treat the blood of Jesus as a precious thing and you can enter right into the presence of God. And when we fail him, it says then Hebrews 4, you can turn to this word, Hebrews 4, verse 16. It says, Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need, because of the blood of Jesus. Not that I just go every time I sin and go and dirty my hands, I go and wash it. No, I can go with confidence to the throne of grace to receive mercy. Lord, I've failed, I've fallen. I've slipped up, please forgive me. I can get mercy, I can be cleansed. Not to go back again and, and be confessing the same thing. Maybe a few times we slip up. But I get grace to help me in my time of need. I can get grace to overcome that sin that each time I was going to the throne of grace to get forgiveness and mercy. That's the confidence that we are to have, my brothers and sisters, in the blood of Jesus. And thirdly, we are to have confidence in God's sovereignty. God is in sovereign control of all the affairs of men. And a lovely word, which I don't know how many of you have taken it seriously to read the book of Daniel. I would encourage you to do that, particularly in these last days. Daniel chapter 4 is 
a heathen king's testimony. We don't have time to look at it, but I wish that you would take time to look at it. It will help you to have confidence in God's sovereign control over all the affairs of mankind, like it says here. Daniel chapter 4. And it says there in, in verse 34, yeah, maybe look at a couple of verses before that. You know, this is the judgment that came on Nebuchadnezzar. You don't have time to look at it, but God brought this king to his senses, and uh, we see why. Because it says there, in order, listen to this, verse 70, middle of verse 17, in order that the living may know that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind, bestows it on whom he wishes, and sets over it the lowliness of men. And he says, this is the dream that he had. And all these things happened. You know, when, when Nebuchadnezzar looked at Babylon, and he says, this is not Babylon that I have built for my glory, for my majesty, and all these things. And when the, when the word was still in his mouth, judgment came. But at the end of that period, verse 34, I, Nebuchadnezzar, this is Nebuchadnezzar's testimony. At the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my reason returned to me. I want to tell you, tell you, my brothers and sisters, when we do that, not just lift our eyes to heaven, but in our spirit, it raised my eyes toward heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High, and praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven. And among the inhabitants of the earth, no one can strike his hand. You know, like a, a child is doing a naughty thing, you strike their hand. No, don't do that. No one can strike his hand and say to him, what have you done? That's the God we worship and believe in. He does what he likes, according to his will, in, not only in the host of heaven, but also among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can say to him, what have you done? Why have you done this to me? Why have you allowed this? He's almighty God. He's in sovereign control. He knows best, my brothers and sisters, even though we may not understand what happens in the home, what happens in our lives, in our job, in our children, he knows best. And he will work it for our best. It will not be calamity. The thoughts, the plans he has for us are not plans for calamity, but for welfare, to give us a future and a hope. That's our God. That's our Father. And to have confidence in his sovereignty, that he's in sovereign control over all our affairs, everything, not a hair from your head, falls to the ground without our Father's knowledge. Do we believe God's word? I'm afraid we could become so familiar. We have so much of the scriptures, so many versions, and so much of preaching today that the word of God doesn't have its effect on your life and mine. And that's why our confidence in God is so weak and lacking. Even being relocated, we don't have time. I've referred to this many times to some of you. It's Acts chapter 17, 26 and 27. Acts, God has predetermined. Look at it for maybe. It will be a help to some of you sometimes wonder sometimes when you have to get relocated or you're looking to go somewhere else. Acts 17. The words, this is a word through the years that has helped me, and I've always prayed, Lord, I want to be in the place where you want me to be. I never want to go to a place to make money, to live a more comfortable life, or uh, yeah, things may be all a mess and chaotic in our country, but Lord, I never want to go to some place that you have not gone before me. And here's Acts chapter 17, for some of you who sometimes go through such situations, it says there, you know, this is when Paul was in Athens. He saw an altar to an unknown God, verse 23. And he said there in verse 26, He made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and boundaries of their habitation. Do you believe that? God has appointed the times 
and the boundaries of where you should live, even geographically, when you have to move from one locality to another. God has determined that. God has already got a house for you. You're looking for a house? God has got a place for you. He knows where He can put you and where He can keep you. He's gone before you. And it says that at, in, uh, at the end of that, He has determined the appointed times and boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God. That is all I have to do. I don't have to get anxious. I don't have to panic. What happens? I go there. There's no CFC there. I've told brothers and sisters, if your connection is with God, you're not worried whether CFC is there or not. You can be a blessing there. You can be a light there. Maybe you can, you can help to, to start a church there. But not say, oh, no CFC there, and we wonder. Then, you know, we have no confidence in God. We have no confidence in God's sovereignty. That they would seek God if perhaps they might grope for Him and find Him, though He is not far from each one of us. That's all we have to do. Wherever God takes us, we seek Him. And believe that He's in sovereign control of everything that happens in our lives, in our children's lives, and what He wants to do for us. And finally, lastly, we are to have confidence in God's provision. Jesus spoke so much about not being worried. And I was sharing this yesterday, not being worried. Worry is something that plagues all of us. Some of us, are I was a worry wart. I sometimes, yeah, I've got better through the years. I think my wife could say that. I would get all upset and, and, and panic sometimes, you know, wondering and when things went wrong in the home and things went wrong with the children. And Jesus knew that. He came in our flesh, that we human beings have a problem with worry. And that's why he devoted so many verses in Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. He says that, do not be worried. Five times, you can go through it in your spare time. Five times, verse 25, do not be worried. Verse 27, who of you by being worried, you can make yourself taller or shorter? Verse 28, why are you worried? Verse 31, do not worry then. And verse 34, so do not worry about tomorrow. Make the kingdom of God your primary concern. Leave it all to, to Him. And like I was saying to the brothers and sisters, we can do one thing that the Holy Spirit tells us to do. Throw all our worries on Him. Cast all your care, all your worries upon Him because He cares for you. We have to be careful that we are not weighed down with the worries of this life. In Luke chapter 1, verse 24, Jesus warned there, Luke chapter 1, verse 20, he said, be on guard. T sorry, 21. Luke 21, verse 34. Verse 34. It says, be on guard. That is a military word. Notice the words the Holy Spirit used. Be on guard so that your hearts will not be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness. And worry is club together with dissipation. Dissipation is people, you know, waste, who are on, who on some habit, alcohol or drugs or something, and they waste their life, they waste their bodies. And worry is, is clubbed together with dissipation and drunkenness. It says, be on guard that your hearts are not weighed down with the worries of life, and that day will not come on you suddenly like a trap. It will come upon all those who dwell on the face of the earth. Worry can weigh our hearts down that we, we, lose, we lose our guard. That's why it says, be on guard. And one last word that you can look at in Philippians in chapter 4, in verse 4 to 7. You know, we think now, that's not what the Holy Spirit says there. Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing, but let the peace of God garrison our hearts. And here it's not just like I was saying yesterday, it's not just one century, a garrison. That's a 
That's a military word again. Not just one sentry at the door, but a garrison around us. And that's what we read there in Philippians in chapter 4, where it says there that we are not to be anxious for anything. Be anxious for nothing. In verse 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. I want you to notice there that every command that God gives us, he tells us what's the solution. If we are worried, we can cast all our worries upon him because he cares for us. And if he, the Holy Spirit says, be anxious for nothing, we can, says in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, this is the word I want to leave with you, the peace of God which passes all understanding will guard or garrison your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And Peter says that, you know, we are to be diligent to be found by him in peace. That when he comes, when Jesus comes, he will find us in peace. Let the peace of God garrison your heart and mind, particularly in these last days. May God bless us, my brothers and sisters, to help us to put our confidence in him so that we can prepare our hearts, so that we can make that our hearts will always be a home for him. And he'll always feel at home in our hearts because we have such confidence in him, just like a husband and wife have such confidence in each other as they live together. Amen. I want to read that verse in Psalm 78, verse 8, once again. Psalm 78, verse 8. We read here why uh, the children of Israel, we, we read here something about the children of Israel and their hearts in verse 8. Why they were not able to have this confidence in God and might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that set not their heart aright, nor prepared their hearts to know God, and whose spirits were not steadfast and faithful to God. We were, God, is, God has been speaking to us about having confidence in God and I just want to uh, share a few examples uh, from the children of Israel, why they were not able to have that confidence in God. The first thing we can turn to Numbers chapter 11 and verse, Numbers chapter 11. You know, there were certain cravings in their hearts. We read that in Numbers chapter 11 and verse 5. The children of Israel are saying, We remember the fish we ate freely in Egypt and without cost, the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. Then we can move to verse 18, where God is speaking. For you have wept in the hearing of the Lord, saying, Who will give us meat to eat? For it was well with us in Egypt, therefore the Lord will give you meat. We see the cravings of their heart. They still valued so many things of Egypt. We know Egypt is a picture of the world. Egypt is a picture of sin. They were even willing to go back to that life of sin and the world to satisfy their cravings. They wanted meat. And we see in in uh, in verse 31, God gives them meat. In verse 31, we read, The Lord brought quails from the sea and let them fall, so they flew low beside the camp, about a day's journey on this side and on the other side, all around the camp, about two cubits, cubits above the ground. And we read verse 32, And all the people rose that day, Please listen carefully. Rose that day and all night and all the next day and caught and gathered the quails. 
He who gathered least gathered ten homers, and they spread them out for themselves round the camp to cure them by drying. We see here in this verse, they did two things. They were catching quails one whole day, one whole night, and the next whole day. They were catching quails. One day's gathering was not sufficient for them. They, they didn't sleep that night. They were catching quails. And the next day also. And we read in that verse that the minimum they gathered was ten homers. You know, when they were collecting manna, God told them, for each person gather one homer. That will be enough for one person. But here the minimum they gathered was ten homers. There were others who gathered 15, 20 homers, 25 homers, probably. But we see their cravings. We see what they wanted. They wanted meat. And much more than what they needed, they wanted to gather and gather and gather. And we, and we read in the following verse, the Lord's anger was kindled against the people. And verse 33, the Lord smote them with a very great plague. No, we see here, brothers and sisters, we can learn something from their life. Clearly, there was an excess, some, something excessive, an excessive pursuit in their life here. And in today, in our life, we can see what is the excessive thing in our life. We can imagine. What are we craving for? Is it entertainment? Is it some more money far beyond what we need? Is it a promotion in our job? What is it that we are really craving? This is what kept the children of Israel from coming into a confidence in God. I don't have time. We read another example in Numbers 25 when they played the harlot. We don't need to turn. They played the harlot with the daughters of Moab and they joined themselves with Baal of Peor, and again the anger of the Lord burned against the children. And in both cases, the Lord's anger burned and there was death. And in contrast, we can see two other men. We can turn to Exodus chapter 33. We, we read thus far about you know, the children of Israel, why they could not have that confidence in God. And now we can see two good examples of two men who could come into that confidence in God. In Exodus chapter 33 and verse 7. Here we read about two men. We read about Moses and we read about Joshua. Moses was a leader. Joshua was a common man. At that point, he was just the servant of Moses. He was a common man like any of us. Moses was a leader, but Joshua was just an ordinary man. But there were, there were common characteristics in both of them. And we read in verse 7, Exodus 33, verse 7 and verse 9. Now Moses used to take his own tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting of God with his own people. And everyone who sought the Lord went out to that tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Moses went to that camp, he pitched his tent there, and he went there every day to seek the Lord. And it says here, whoever, everyone who sought the Lord also went there. Anyone in the camp could have done that, could have gone to the tent of meeting. And we read in verse 9, the last part, the Lord would talk with Moses. Verse 11, the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Moses returned to the camp. Now we read about Joshua, but his servant Joshua, son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tent. We see here two men in this tent seeking God. They were not like the rest of Israel. Their cravings were not like the rest of Israel. We see two men whose hearts were set on seeking God. Behind closed doors, they were 
with God. They took time to meet with God and God would talk with them. And we read this beautiful verse in verse 17. I pray we will all covet this, what God spoke about Moses. I pray this will be the desire of our heart. Each one of us will covet this. And the Lord said to Moses, I will do this thing, for you have found favor, loving kindness and mercy in my sight. And this is the part, I know you personally and by name. These men who went inside that tent to seek God, God knew them personally and by name. This is what God wants to do for each one of us brothers. He wants us, he wants to know us personally and he wants to tell us, I know you and I know you by name because you meet with me every day. And one more, one more example of, uh, about Moses and uh, Joshua, we, we don't have time, but in Exodus chapter 32, I'll very quickly go through that in Exodus chapter 32, verse 1. Uh, we know that Moses was up on the mountain and he was delaying. He was up on the mountain and, you know, some beautiful things are written in these two chapters. You know, before God gave the law, the tablets of stone to Moses, we read from verse 12 to verse 17, God was first speaking to Moses. God was revealing his heart to Moses before he gave them the law. God opened his heart and he spoke to Moses and he showed him his heart. He showed him himself. And then, you know, we, we read 31 verse 18, we read, he gave to Moses when he had ceased communing with him on Mount Sinai, the two tables of the testimony, the tablets of stone, written with the finger of God. The first thing God wanted to do was reveal himself to Moses. God wants, wanted to show Moses himself and his heart. After that, God wrote on the tablets. That's what God wants to do to, for us too today. He wants to show himself to us first. Then he wants to write his law on the tablets of our heart. This is the longing of God's heart. And, you know, we, we read the same thing two chapters later in uh, chapter 34. You know the story, Moses came down, he broke the tablets because of sin in the camp. But again, God calls him up and it's the same thing God does. He speaks and he shows Moses his heart and he shows Moses himself. That he's a God full of loving kindness and compassion. And then he gives him the uh, tablets. And we know Moses' face shone when he came down from the mountain. We were... We can, we, can, we can see clearly, brothers and sisters, that there was a difference between the rest of Israel and between Moses and Joshua. And God wants to challenge us not to follow the example of the children of Israel, but to follow Mo Moses and Joshua's example. What he did for them, he wants to do for us today in our generation. We, we heard about the four things we can have confidence in God. Confidence in God's love, confidence to come to Him boldly, confidence in His sovereignty over our lives, and confidence in His provision for us. Mo Moses and Joshua, they had this confidence in God, in His love, that freedom to come to Him, seeing His sovereignty and seeing His provision. Why did they have this confidence? Because they did those two things. They sought God alone behind closed doors. And second, they were willing to go up to the mountain. We read even Joshua was there. Moses was with God on the mountain, but Joshua was also on the mountain a little below. They wanted to be with God, and they wanted to know God's heart, and they wanted God to show them his word and write his word on their hearts. This is what God wants to do for us today, brothers and sisters.
What he did for Moses and Joshua, he wants to do for each one of us. But, and he wants to bring each one of us into that confidence in him. But he can do that only if we do these two things that these men did. Seek him alone, behind closed doors, and go to him and say, Lord, will you open your word to me? Will you reveal your word to me? Will you write your word on my heart? God wants to do this, brothers and sisters, for each one of us, God wants to do this. May we repent of the times we have had other cravings and we have longed for other things in our life. Some of the things I mentioned, entertainment or an excess uh, seeking after money or excess seeking after the things of this world. We don't need them. God will add them to our lives. God wants us to seek Him, know Him, and come to this confidence in Him. I believe God wants to do this for every one of us. This is not only for Moses and Joshua, it's for every one of us, brothers and sisters. God wants to do this in your life. In your life, God wants to do this. Will you reach out to Him this morning and pray, Lord, help me, Lord, to set my heart aright and set my heart on you and be steadfast to you that this confidence that we heard of can be in each one of our hearts. Amen.